I'm um, Graham Palmer and I'm going to talk on behalf of a group of people who I'll show in a minute on the biodiversity conservation um, and disturbance area. And it's worth noting, as Jess did, that uh, a lot of what's our sort of history was wrapped up in this Centre for Environmental Management, the, the, this biodiversity conservation and disturbance part. So um, we've got a Looking around here, I've got a lot of links with um, people out there uh, through that time. So we are a diverse group, and this is just the core group which I've put up here. You'll know uh, many of the faces. Uh, yeah. So Wendy Wright, Gippsland, uh, Flory, Fiona Hogan, based in Gippsland, myself, Nick <coughs> Brooks, Simon Cook, and Jess Reeves, now uh, based in Gippsland. So this is the core, but then there's a, a group of postdocs, you know, honor students, third year students, research assistants that feed into this. But when looking at this group, there's all sorts of terms you could use to categorize what each uh, particular person is. So I think it, it captures nicely the diversity within the group. Our strengths uh, are around, I guess, this disturbance impact and response, so biodiversity response to changes in environment. Strong in forest ecology, landscape ecology, so big picture sort of stuff, paleoecology, and then getting into specialist sort of landscapes like urban ecology, uh, wildlife ecology. A lot of us, um, there's a group of uh, particular with an interest in wildlife, but also in, in botany. And I'll talk further, particularly about wild DNA, which is a um, an exciting aspect of this, which is, which is new to us um, through the Gippsland merger. Capabilities. I think uh, they come from a number of areas. They can be you know, research driven, where we've got our interests and our ideas to, uh, to pursue, but our best, I think our best applicability and our best engagement has come when we work with industry uh, to address problems. You know, that's where you get real impact in your research. So a number of approaches for real-time monitoring. Um, Backy approaches where you know we look at before, after, and then control impact and see what's happening through time. When we move to large scale, it's often a need to move to things which we refer to as space for time approaches, where you, you've got a, uh, a whole range of variation in the landscape and you assume that time, uh, through time, has treated each of these um, evenly, and you can, through that approach, you can look back in time. It, it allows you to look at a much bigger scale while compacting that time component down. And we also look at retrospective studies where you know, we look at past disturbance and you know, how it's playing out in contemporary sort of ecosystems. There is this approach of short-term <coughs> targeted questions and this often comes about through industry when a problem arises and we've, um, you know, we've engaged uh, with those particular agencies or organisations to address that problem. That's, that's sort of a contract research sort of approach but I think the, the, um, the important thing out of it is that we've got a good history of turning that into an actual research uh, sort of um, experience. So I think I've just got an example here of uh, the image for your tree profiles. But this we looked at um, the impact of a road, potential road on glider crossings. You know, we're looking at things like um, angles of glides, etc. needed, and points of um, takeoff to ensure that impact on a threat species was was negated. Uh, some of you will be aware we also have a big property. Up in New South Wales, the university owns Nanya Research Station up in the semi arid area. I think this gives us a unique background in that it gives us a chance to, to try things out experimentally and research wise, but it also gives us you know, full on experience as a land manager. So if we actually manage that land, we make the decisions on how that land is managed and conservation. And it's more, it's it's um, recognised under the, um, you know, the, the National Party legislation in the state. Um, 
So it provides a really unique background to a lot of our a lot of our research. Looking back through time and the contributions we've sort of um, managed to to make, they range from you know that that consultancy uh, report that contract research report, some which have been able to be flipped into academic papers, application of theory to on-ground solutions where we're actually you know, applying knowledge um, in a sense to get a, the right solution, monitoring and evaluation. A lot of organisations, land managers, agencies require monitoring and if we can, if that can be set up right between the organisation and the researchers, then they can have a really strong research design element to it. Uh, feeding into policy development. Small and large scale contract research. And then into specialist information, DNA analysis, mapping and visualisation. I'll talk a bit about DNA analysis and, and Rob will probably pick up with the survey stuff about visualising data. And of course we have capacity with research students. There's plenty um, Plenty that we can provide in that space. In terms of capacity, it's a bit about knowledge, um, it's a bit about equipment, it's a bit about experience. So we have we have the necessary equipment to conduct our research, be it around flora, fauna, um, wildlife, genetics. We have specialist uh, analytical facilities, and uh, you'll be able to see these on Priorities Tour if you like, around seed ecology labs looking at things we can you know, manipulate CO2, temperature, photo period, which in a lab sense gives us a really good window to look at potential effects of climate change, etc. on on, um, on plants. Our connections and collaborations are broad. I mean, I, I, we have certainly engaged with a lot of people in this audience uh, today already, but within the university, we do have, um, you know, we certainly have vet health sort of parts of the university, which we can look at in an animal health um, aspect, data visualisation, have very strong stats and mathematical modelling to um, this university, which, you know, in terms of statistical analysis and research design is, um, is a real bonus. Outside, we readily engage with other universities, government and government agencies, industry, non-government organisations. I think the benefit here is that as a university, it, it opens up opportunities where we can attract funding through things like ARC um, linkage grants with the help of the organisation. So organisations get um, access to potential funding um, from the university side. I'll just run through some quick examples uh, of what, what we've um, looked at and what we're looking at and uh, potentially in the future. Strong focus on fire as a disturbance. So this comes about you know, uh, exploring biodiversity and fire being one of the main disturbing agents in our part of the world in natural systems. And the broader picture is looking at the identification of appropriate fire regimes for key ecological communities and species, so maintaining biodiversity. Within that, we've, we've set up large-scale landscape um, experiments, um, particularly through the, the, um, this part of the world, the central Victorian uplands, but also um, smaller projects in Gippsland and the Otways. We're monitoring actual key ecological resources. Things like hollow bearing trees, refuge habitats, coarse woody debris, landscape, fire mosaics. So monitoring these through time and there's a whole raft of things that can spin out of this. That can spin out of the impact of a single fire. It can look at fires through time. It can even look at you know sort of catchment health sort of thing where if we're matching our fire regimes uh, to the requirements of vegetation. This sort of design, we'll have a picture here just uh, west of uh, the uh, Ballarat Enfield region. Typical fire, fire scar or time since fire 
uh, map here, red sites representing surveys, survey sites, and the images just simply capture that space for time approach that we can use where we can um, look at different histories through time, look at them now in very similar locations, so you know, rainfall and that isn't going to vary too much between them, and we can look at the results from this. Urban ecology is another area uh, that we look at. Uh, Amy's strong in urban ecology. Um, and we've worked in Melbourne and um, sort of shifting what we found. Well, we've looked at Melbourne as, a, I guess, a broad case study or a case series, a number of studies. And now we're starting to look at how this works in a Ballarat context. There's a major regional centre. Does, does the same apply? Do the same patterns and processes in the landscape work? So this has been a collaborative exercise between a number of unis and NGOs. Had good industry engagement. Because you know these are the people who actually want to manage the land. They want to know the, the right stuff. They don't want to manage it blindly. Uh, research students. And it's leading to, um, you know, even in an international context, um, collaborating and looking at you know various cities across the globe. So if we look at Melbourne as a case study, like in Melbourne, you know, sort of Yarra Bend region, we can see we can look at biodiversity within the actual streetscape, so within the, you know, the housing, the housing component of the landscape, we can look at it in the vegetation patches, and we've looked at uh, each of these components, but then we can also adopt an actual species-oriented um, approach. And as I said, we use this to then see if we kind of have, um, you know, some understanding of what's going on in Melbourne, and we're in the process now of applying this to the Ballarat landscape. Now, it does the same hold out this area. Riparian well, ecology is an interesting one. It certainly draws on a diverse group um, within the university, you know, obviously aquatic terrestrial ecosystems at play and then catchments and nutrient flows, etc. But the strong focus here is looking at riparian zones, you know, not just as the, the sort of bit that's fringing the river, but looking at it as a landscape feature that is actually disproportionately of high biodiversity conservation focus. Now we kind of recognise that it is um, well recognised globally. But we can also put that in the context of things like fire ecology research, where we're looking at this now as okay, so our riparian zone becomes a key refuge habitat and can actually uh, be critically important in that ecosystem's response to uh, an impact such as fire. Then a whole range of species focused research and again these have these little elements of um, disturbance and impact looking at them so we looked at uh, squirrel gliders and road infrastructure, brolgas and wind farm development, EPBC species risk assessment for surf coast shire, great ocean walk impact assessment of that and we've been lucky enough to be able to monitor that um, before the walk went into place, just when the walk went into place, we just revisited it again in the last few weeks, um, you know, sort of seven or eight years since the walk's been in place. Population management of species, things like koalas, Snake Island, looking at uh, koala over browsing and vegetation in certain down at Otway, Malifowl, Streslecky Gum, some pest species, Samba Deer, you know, a, 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 a species of population is just skyrocketing across Victoria at the moment in terms of numbers but also in, um, in terms of distribution and extent. Internationally, Wendy Wright from Gippsland, as I mentioned, has been very active uh, in China, Nepal, and uh, Kalimantan, Indonesia, working with local communities around their interaction with wildlife, uh, you know, balancing conflict conservation, recreation, human wildlife conflict, social aspects of forest management, you know, actual biodiversity use, cultural economic values within areas. And, and this has led to you know, things like um, workshops where you know, actually working with these traditional communities or these local communities and how they um, not only manage but interact and potentially benefit from wildlife. 
to finish off with, I just want to run through um, wild DNA. Now, this is something that is driven by Fiona Hogan down at um, our Gippsland campus, looking at um, DNA of species and what this can tell us. So, genetic testing, um, we all know, you know genetics is important for identifying individuals. Uh, there's been development of molecular technologies for ecological applications. And the area uh, Fiona's working in is specialising in isolating DNA from non-invasively sourced samples. So things like scats, uh, fur samples, feathers, where we're not actually, um, so non-invasive, not actually handling the animal, but these things tend to be a lot more freely available. And that's really important for cryptic species. Things like the quoll, um, down the Otways, you know, a bit about that, you know, monitoring that is it's very hard to detect, but scat detection plays a role. Uh, so it allows for opportunistic sampling. Can lead to large scale studies, increase sample size, so with power flower, put out a national call for people to send in feathers of power flower, and all of a sudden you start to get a genetic map of um, the power flower population across the country. It's eth ethically pre preferred. You know, we're not using um, trapping or handling of animals, and this detected old uh, tomato is involved is really um, oh, somewhat taking off. So Fiona's working with a group in Queensland using detector dogs to um, locate koalas. They're a bit scarce on the ground they are in this part of the world to locate koala scats. Detector dogs are being used in the Otways for tiger quolls, and I think long known. Uh, and that's blue as well. So potential there. And what this tells us is it gives gender identification, so it can actually identify species, it can identify history of populations. Um, the sampling is relatively easy. You know, we can call for uh, new descending feathers, etc. And the actual analysis can be done, but also reporting wise. And one of the projects I mentioned was the Queensland Koala Project, where um, isolating DNA from koala scats, giving a gender, a DNA profile of the population, a health of the animal, so we look for things like chlamydia, koala retrovirus, and this is working with one of the um, environment groups on there, a consultancy, um, who are detecting these scats uh, by dogs. So this genetic stuff is really important. It really feeds into a lot of those projects that I talked about. We can look at taxonomy. You know, what are our conservation priorities? Historic population trends. We can get a map, genetic-wise, of where populations have come from, where they've been in the past, their structure, the census. And this can work into really applied solutions or problems. You know, if we're looking at translocating, Individuals, and you know, this is something that's increasing in, in <coughs> thinking in today's world. Well, we can start to see, okay, or map out a plan. Is this is this a good idea? And also fragmentation, we look at connection between populations. So we can look at A and B and how they connect. Uh, so that's a rundown of the uh, biodiversity conservation part. The Impact Ecology Group. And I think Nick's talking now about our uh, restoration. So I just got up there living with Bushfire. That's a conference which uh, we're involved in and uh, suitable to all the catchment. Uh, let me know if you want any information about that. That would be my title.